So we now have a motivation for why we want to study non-coherent communication, and we have the general form of the signals we're going to use, the SIFT, and we've noted that we're not going to do any type of phase modulation, we're just going to do amplitude modulation. Let's go ahead and do the analysis for the optimal receiver structure that we are going to use for binary non-coherent communication. So again, we're restricting ourselves to a binary scheme. There are only two signals, signal S0 and S1. So this here is the optimal receiver structure for non-coherent communication. And what we're going to do in the subsequent slides is basically analyze this scheme, understand how it works, and understand its performance. So first, let's just inspect what's going on. We have the received signal SIFT plus the additive white Gaussian noise process X of T. It's not saying anything on this chart that indicates that it's AWGN, but that's what we almost always assume in our analysis. And what are we doing? We're basically, we have two branches. We have four branches. These two right here help us decode S0 if it's present. And these two branches right here help us decode S1 of T if it is present. So for two signals, I actually have four branches here. Most of the schemes we've looked at so far when I've had two signals, I would just have a single correlator branch for S0 of T and a single correlator branch for S1 of T. Here I have two branches for S0 of T and two branches for S1 of T. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is a non-coherent scheme. So you can see what's going on. Let's focus just on this top part. Since I don't know the carrier phase, first of all, note that the carrier phase doesn't show up anywhere. There is no phi anywhere. So we can tell that this is a non-coherent scheme because I'm not using phi anywhere in my reception. Since I don't know what phi is, here's what I do. I mix with a cosine and I mix with a sine. So basically, since I don't know what phi is, I mix with two different functions that basically cover all the bases. I, I can mix with an in-phase piece, and I can mix with a quadrature piece, and no matter what the true phase is of the incoming signal, I'm going to capture all of its energy in either the cosine or the sine. And similarly for these two dot bottom branches here, the only difference being obviously that this set of branches is to help us decode S1 of T. So notice some other things here. The amplitudes of the cosines and sines we note as W of T. And those are just there to enable us to do an analysis that accounts for mismatch in baseband pulse shapes. In general, we are going to let W I of T equal M I of T. So in general, there won't be any mismatch and we'll be able to use the actual baseband pulse shape here at the receiver, but using the W's gives us a mathematical mechanism to analyze the impact of a mismatch if we want to do that. Okay, So what do we do? We mix with a cosine, we integrate from 0 to t, and the output of that we denote u0. Similarly right here we mix with a sine, we integrate, and the output of that we call v0. We square u of 0, we square v of 0, and then we add those two things together and that gives us a quantity which is now equal to u0 squared plus v0 squared. And that is a quantity that we call r0 squared. We're very accustomed to using z as our decision statistic. Here, our decision statistic, we're denoting r. You'll see why we call it r here shortly. But the decision statistic here on this branch is r0 squared. Same type of thing down here, except everything has a 1. We have a u of 1, a v of 1. We square them both, sum them, so we have a u1 squared plus a v1 squared, and that sum is what we call r1 squared. Comparing r0 squared to r1 squared lets us choose our decision, and intuitively we think we know what should happen. When you send s0, r0 squared should be big, and r1 squared should be small, and you should decide r0 squared is the big one, so s0 was sent. If s1 of t was sent, then r1 squared should be large relative to r0 of squared, and we should decide that s1 of t was sent. So this is the structure. This is some of the notation, these u's and v's with subscripts, the r sub 0, the r sub 1, and doing the analysis of this is now what we want to do. This is an optimum structure. It's optimum in both a minimax sense and a maximum likelihood sense. So this is the thing to do, and analyzing it is what we want to turn our attention to now.